Hi, it's the mic. Yeah, OK. Um, hi, I'm Simon Branford from the University of Birmingham, and I'm going to talk about our experiences with EasyBuild, and particularly that question that's just come up and been talked about, having Power9 in the room, and um, but still supporting Intel um, CPUs at the same time. University of Birmingham, just in case you don't know, I'm talking about the one in England, has caused confusion before. Um, details about the university and if you're really interested about them, go and watch the video afterwards and just freeze the slide. <coughs> um, this is um, our water-cooled server room. The uh, photo is 18 months old from memory. Um, so the IBM Power 9, there's only one rack there, there's actually a second one right next to it now. Um, this, <coughs> I haven't got hold of an up-to-date photo yet. We've provided the Birmingham Environment for Academic Research. Yes, that is somebody looking for a nice acronym, which allows <coughs> us to just put pictures of bears everywhere and have bears that just go with us to any um, of our engagements on campus. Uh, <laughs> We provide not just the HPC, we provide the storage, the high-speed networking. We've got a lot of medical people in the university. So we have a lot of sort of sequencing technology, imaging technology connected to high-speed network to drop data straight back onto our storage, which they can then analyze with our system. We currently have the largest Power, a Power 9 AI cluster in the UK. Um, I'm expecting that will change later this year, but I can still claim that at the moment. The group I'm in, or the wider group I'm in, is advanced research computing. Um, we're split into three sections. Architecture, infrastructure and systems. Deal with system design, service integration, and the systems up to the operating system level. We have an engagement group who go out around the university tell everybody about our services and convince them that, that all the new researchers get to meet the engagement group and go get told, you know, please use our systems, we're there. Um, and I'm in the software group. One of the main things is the hate sport of HBC software, the installation. Um, we're also there to improve research software across the campus, i.e. not just on HPC, you know, outside of that, you know, just make research better. Um, I'm now going to describe what we have, and it sort of impacts some of our decisions about what we do. Blue Bear was started in 2012, or this generation of Blue Bear was started in 2012. This is the version 3 Blue Bear. We still have the same Blue Bear um, because we do rolling. Um, I'll talk in the next slide about the last lot that's just about to go away. Um, it is available for free to all researchers in the university. If you're doing research, you can ask, get uh, use of it, and you will. I can't state enough how many bioinformaticians we have at our university and all that um, there. We do have other users. We do have some reasonable amount of traditional engineering type users, computational chemistry, physics. This means, though, that a lot most, well, if you count by jobs, we're a high throughput, not high performance computing center. We do have high performance computing, you know, the large provided part of Blue Bear. Blue Bear also allows a framework for a research group or researcher to come to us. I've got this amount of money. Can I have my own resource um, in there? And they, within a framework of things they can buy, they can go, yeah, we'll have some extra nodes in there. Often, um, these will be specialist resources, so there's quite often GPU nodes are in the specialist resources of particular research groups or large memory nodes. Um, so, what is Blue Bear at the moment? All of that. Um, we have the Sandy Bridge nodes, which were the original 2012 ones, uh, and, 20, and with some more incoming in 2013. They are, we're about to start decommissioning the last of those. They will go at Easter this year. And I say that, and I'm hoping that's public knowledge back to our <laughs> university, just as we are being recorded. Um, I know we've started telling all the people. We also have Haswell and Broadwell, um, which are together, uh, which we treat as the same thing. And we have some GPU nodes in there. Um, we did have Sandy Bridge GPU nodes, but they got de decommissioned last year. 
I've put the, the Sky Lake in brackets. That is because we have one user-owned resource with two uh, V100s in it. We have just the one of them, and because the GPUs are the important bit in that particular user-owned resource, we just treat it as a Haswell um, broad well. Uh, we've just sort of simplified out that we're not going to try and build the entire software stack. This was just one of these moments of research that came to us. I've got money, I have to spend it now. We couldn't, we were, because he wanted GPUs, we couldn't buy any more um, Haswell Broadwell GPU nodes at that moment, and Cascade Lake hadn't been released at that moment. It was like, we're just gonna have to fit a Sky Lake uh, box in. We've got Cascade Lake, and then the important bit, or the extra bit, we've got these Power 9 boxes. Um, we have uh, 11 of them. Um, some are shared use across the university, some are owned by, or sorry, uh, are for the computational, um, computational biology. Each of our boxes, four V100, one terabyte of memory, very beefy. One of the important bits of the, uh, P, uh, the Power9 systems is fast interconnect between the GPUs and between the GPUs and the system memory. So you can transfer data inside the box quite quickly. And if that didn't make it our lives quite complicated, we also offer um, virtual machines only on the Intel systems, um, but they add an extra complexity. Yes, same sense of there, but they can also have a version of Ubuntu. Um, and fairly much, if you can type a module load command in there, the same module load command will work on there, um, either of those two. Um, with a few extra complications we throw in, G the storage is NFS as opposed to the GPFS there, and these don't have an InfiniBand connection, which just makes building some of the modules just a little bit more interesting. So I said we had bioinformaticians, and this sort of comes into the next slide. We, that is our... That is our 2019 of, uh, installed software where the size of uh, the program name is how many versions of that software installed. Our application count is over a thousand. Um, that's counting at a, that, that's equivalent to the directory level in the EasyConfig repository. Version count, so actual individual EasyConfigs, we're at just over 3,200. And when you multiply that out, because we build everything for in the individual architecture, we're up to, uh, what's that, 11,000 and a bit. Um, we have lots of requests for software, and lots of it is bioinformatics. Um, we do spend quite a lot of time installing um, across our cluster. Um, keeps us nice and busy. So I'm now just sort of going to go to the history of Easy Build at Birmingham. I have to preface this with a comment. I wasn't here at this point. I was, some, I was at a completely different university working as a postdoc in evolutionary biology. So um, I, 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 I'm going to try and deny I'm one of those people who cause problems with bioinformatics software. But yes, I have been involved with writing some of it. Um, <laughs> yeah, I, I now want to go back and see myself a few years ago and say, can we do it a bit better? <laughs> we just improve life. Um, at Birmingham, we started using Easy Build in 2016, uh, but obviously Blue Bear had been around three or four years at that point, and there was a desire to make Easy Build look like what was already there. And, and before that, we were hand building software, every, you know, everything custom installed, um, and all the problems that anybody who's tried to do that for a large amount of software will know about. But uh, because we wanted it to look like and had it, you know, what was already there, lots of local customizations. And this really caused two major problems. Um, trying to pull anything from the, from the main easy build repositories into our system was horrible because it would be on the wrong tool chain, wrong everything, wasn't how we wanted it to look or anything. Also meant we couldn't contribute anything back because what we were producing looked nothing like what was in the main easy build repository. Um, which just, you know, the whole point of using a tool like easy build is the community that 
make your life easier. So between uh, my boss Ed and myself, I joined in 2017. He joined in late 2016. So Easy Build predates him being there as well, I believe. Um, basically, we went, we're going to move closer to upstream. Let's get us closer. Let's work, you know, how can we get this to just love? We're just going to work out when do we actually need these customizations? And if we really don't, we're just going to try and get rid of them. We're just going to move closer and closer. And we're actually fairly close to the sort of standard uh, flat naming module scheme now. We're um, very there. But coming through 2017, 2018, we then, that's when the Power 9 arrived. And I've had a couple of comments. Yeah, out of the box at that point when it first arrived, <coughs> CUDA just installed weirdly or didn't install at all. Um, many, many problems. There's a whole bunch of our easy configs from that era that have that in them because what ha then happens is it then goes, when we're on power nine, we'll do something completely different. Um, yeah, and it was difficult. Um, I have to say, part of that is just a lot of the software at that time, we were waiting for the software developers to make their software work, you know, install on Power9 at all. So we were also having to put in quite a lot of patches of patch this at this point because you've done there. And things have got a lot, lot better. A lot of the software now just works out of the box on Power9 and works in exactly the same way. Um, we've also worked with the Easy Build maintainers, and I have to say big thank you for working with us on this, is we've now got, um, we believe, the framework in place, the you know, that things can work in the blocks, can work in the configs in such a way that you can just install and you'll basically not see a difference. Um, it just allow us to install, you know, with just a few extra lines, just allow things to go. It also means if someone comes along with a new architecture, there should be all the tools in place for them to just work through and just add a little bit extra into an easy config or a little bit extra into an easy block and it will just install. That's what we believe. We haven't tested that because at the moment there's, and I'm hoping we're not going down a, to even another architecture. That's what I'm hoping anyway. Um, I'll wait and find the bad news later probably. Um, also, uh, for the last several years, we've been using the internal GitLab. Um, starting with our 2019B setup, we're now using our um, GitHub. So if you want to see what we're doing, it's there. Sometimes we do try to contribute as much back as possible, but sometimes it will be in our repository waiting for one of us to have a few free minutes to also push it back. Um, we're aiming to, call it, like I said, contribute much more upstream. James contributed his first easy configs um, earlier this month. Um, so that's made us quite happy. Um, I'll also talk about how we work, because I think we work slightly, we have slightly, we still do have a little bit of a different setup. Um, users request installations from us. We don't install anything that isn't requested, but we decide what tool chain we're going to put, we're going to put it in. Yes, we do look to see what modules they're using or ask them what other software they're using and might want to use at the same time, but we but we basically make the decision, which means we tend to not install anything against the older tool chain. At the moment, we're only actively working in 2019A and 2019B tool chains. Um, Occasionally, we might have a bit of software that involves us needing an older tool chain, but where possible, we'll just port things to the newer one. Um, we have a setup where, it, when we were using GitLab, it was a complete repository. Now we've moved to GitHub, where it's actually just a branch inside the repository. So if you look on our, the GitHub page I mentioned, you'll find the easy config, uh, fork of the easy config uh, framework and blocks repositories, and each one will have a 2019B branch. That 2019B branch is what is live on our system, um, you know, or what we're live installing from on our systems. Um, important bit to us is each developer in ours actually has their own e easy build environments that where we don't share anything across, so each developer can work independently. And something I say and add at this point, 
There is no piece of software used live on our system that I've, I've actually built this, the live version for. I don't actually build like, the software that our users use live. I just develop it and then hand it over to either James or Ed to install. Um, so we do this sort of process where one of us develops it in our own development environment. We review, self-review into our own uh, either GitLab or GitHub, and then that gets built on our live system. Our setup, we've got multiple architectures. So how do we set it up? Well, we just add it into the path. Well, the multiple operating systems and multiple architectures. Yeah, the path will reflect what it is. If you load, so if you, but we then set up the path so that when a user goes module load, Python, whatever version, if they're on a Cascade Lake, they get the Cascade Lake inst uh, installed version. If they're on the Power 9, they get the Power 9 version. Um, they won't know which one they're coming from. Um, to answer sort of the question that got asked a few minutes ago about that, and, and to do it with SRO and whatever, we've taught, we have a framework in place where people can run interactive jobs. And because of what I said about high throughput computing, and not really having a lot of high performance of these sort of major, large parallel jobs. We don't find this causes any problem to our users because very few of them ever use SRUN for anything. Um, when you submit a job to our cluster, you can specify I want it on a particular, well, if you want to run the Power 9, you have to explicitly ask for it. But if you want, if you just want an Intel chip, you can just go run on an, in, you know, run on anything um, you, you know, by default, you can just submit a job. It will run on across any any of the Intel, but it is constrained to only run on one type of hardware. Um, so, if you submit it a multi-node job, it will either say go all to Sandy Bridge or all to Cascade Lake. It won't span across. Um, we do have a few users who build their own software, and whenever any of them come to us, we we just suggest please come and talk to us first. And then we just tell them what options they've got. You know, you can build on the lowest common on the Sandy Bridge and it works across them, or build an architecture version um, there. Other things we've done, I told you how much software we were installing. Up until I think it was September last year, we hand documented the um, installs, or rather, we failed to hand document any of them because there were too many to document. We built a piece of software. Um, unfortunately, it's not very clear in here, but that site manually, uh, sorry, automatically generated. We finished doing an install. We just run a script. It just documents the web, you know, a standard in information about that package that we've just installed, or packages we've just installed. And we can then just add some more extra information if we want to as well. And the other bit is the reframe developers are here. That is our test report from a couple of nights ago. We test some chunk of those uh, modules we've got. That number, uh, 1,000 whatever, it looks fairly impressive until you remember that number I said earlier that we've got um, 11,000 modules on dark, uh, different architectures. So we want to test more of them, but as with anything, time. <laughs> and thank you for listening. You said that you have like more HTC type of workloads. So you use Slurm or use any other scheduler for that? Uh, we use Slurm um, for that. We, we do spend a lot of time talking to users about using array jobs, um, which are nicer for the scheduler than anything else. Um, uh, yeah, I, it's surprising. Um, we've, we've gone down the Slurm route and we're sticking with it because at the moment because it works reasonably well. Um. I have a I have a question. How many people are is it just the three of you um, in, uh, installing software, writing easy configs for those eleven? There's a fourth person as well at the moment. We're gaining a new person in a month's time. Yeah. Um, yeah so there'll be up to five of us. Um, though it is 
reasonably much James's full-time job. It's um, the other three of us, it's part of our role, not all of our role. Yeah. And the new person, it's going to be all of his role. Um, how, how was it before you started using EasyBuild? I, I don't think you had 11,000 installations then, right? No. <laughs> uh, it was hand, everything was hand installed. There would have been two or three people back then. Um, not as much was, you know, not as much was getting installed. It was a little bit simpler back then because there only would have been Sandy Bridge until nearly the point where we start using Easy Build. Um, so at least that removes some of the complexity. But I, I don't know in answer to, as to as how or why they sustained it for so long yeah. because. They, they, were just, they, they were just saying no to requests more often. I, I'm assuming so. I mean, we, I, I do know that now, because what I sort of hid, hid away in there when I was talking about the numbers in our group, there was a big explosion in 2017, which is when I joined. There was also a big group join, a fair number joined the year before. So basically the group doubled in size twice. Mm. Um, on the back of people realizing that if you have a HPC system in the university, it's really useful if you have people who can support and help your researchers use it. It doesn't just make research better by sitting in the corner <laughs> by itself. You need uh, to invest in it. Um, yes. So, I mean, yeah, I would have said, I guess they were saying no to a lot more requests. Um, I've not. For, for the reframe tests, is that in the GitHub repo as well? or Not at the moment. I'm I, uh, Having talked to people here, I will try and get that into our public yeah. re, uh, repository to split out what we've done. Yeah. Um, it, it sort of hides around a little bit in that we have a QoS in our system that allows jobs for up to 10 minutes, um, which, use, which allows them to run even on those user-owned resources. Um, which allows us to basically test everything every night. That's how we can get them all run. But it does mean that some of our tests are chopped up to into 10 minute slices or quicker than 10 minute slices. Do, do you um, think it would make sense to have an, a collaborative effort across sites for tests like we have for easy configs? Um, I think so. I, I, I don't know how different every site setup is because obviously we are slightly different in how we, well actually we're not that different now from just installing the main easy configs mm. but i don't know how different as to whether because that will mean the tests have to be different or whether just making them accessible to everybody by us making you know as public will just help and um, yeah it's a matter of i guess yeah. being able to filter tests or yeah and hide all the system specific stuff, stuff. but I, I guess free reframes should already support that, right? Yeah. If a reframe config. Yes, the thing is that there are always so yeah, it, a reframe hides most of this stuff. Uh, but again, I mean it depends now on the test. Uh, whether you needed to do slight adaptations or set extra specific variables for your system or things like that. To my experience, if the tests are simple, then it's they're easy to share or very standard. Um, with minimal changes, then uh, it depends. Then if you have more complex specific to your system or... Uh, but in that case, again, I can take a, uh, a test from uh, from from there, and then I'm just don't run it because it's not in my config. Yeah, but I, I don't know, yeah. run it or tweak it or. Yeah. I'm just kind of curious if you have some statistics on the bioinformatics packages. I know for me, like maybe three or four years ago, it was maybe one a month, and now it seems like several a week. So. So. Uh, it definitely sit well i've only got about two years of experience to talk from there it definitely seems we've had an explosion um in requests from that sort of area um i will actually uh, the some of the information we might be able to back generate to work out um i'll see whether we can or not but we might be able to advise but yeah it just seems we just get lots of requests from the bioinformatics um 
It, it's a surprise when somebody, I installed a new version of Open Phone recently, which I think the first, we realized we didn't, we hadn't installed any Open Phone versions in a year. <laughs> it's just like, uh, and we have quite a lot of Open Phone users, it's just like none of them wanted anything new. And then suddenly it was like, oh, which also led us to a slightly different problem. We have, a, we have access and support for one of the UK tier two systems, I, well, our users on it, and we had to work out how to bootstrap on somebody else's system where we couldn't install anything at the OS level to get easy build. So we went, we're going to easy build it, but we had to work out how to get a compiler that we could at least get GCC built to then go on, which was an interesting experience. 